Take care, everyone. Take care, everyone. Welcome to Minute 30 of Awake, the life of Yogananda, Minute by Minute podcast. Um, how are you doing, Mike? I'm very well today. Um, I feel like full of energy because I fasted yesterday. That Good. always gives me some oh, nice You fasted on the right day. Yesterday was um, a day. Yeah. Uh, how are you? Uh, the right day? Why? I know. It's just, it's just um, because it's a few days. Uh, Diwali's tomorrow. Uh, as we record this, it is the uh, 4th of um fourth of november um so yeah so now's a good time to do uh, good spiritual practices chris yeah yeah good uh didn't didn't quite fast yesterday and then had a massive lunch so you know just at a in the probably food coma and obviously <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no i'm good all, all, all good happy to be here good yeah yesterday i fasted and today i just picked out a little bit <laughs> yeah undid all the good work <laughs> okay Yogananda said uh, do not overeat you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. yes and then and then the stomach says eat eat yeah, i want eat, more eat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make up for yesterday <laughs> who's louder yeah. who's louder <laughs> like, do not do not overeat over a period of time or just once <laughs> I don't know. Did he specify? <laughs> i'm working on that actually um i think it'd be better if i was like better at like i'm really good at fasting but i'm not good at eating in moderation mm-hmm. when i'm not fasting so it's like a catch-22 yeah. yeah, don't know what yeah. to do in life Anyway, <laughs> swings and roundabout state. You're doing exactly, good. exactly. So minute thirty. It's really about two things. Um, firstly, it's about James Lynn, who is the second president of Self Realization Fellowship, and he is um, his uh, sannyasi name is Rajasi Janakananda, who you may have heard about. Um, so the minute really talks about he's 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 being narrated so it's not him actually speaking he says uh you know things like i was leading a very unsatisfactory life you know and he was having lots of you know troubles even though he had money and there's pictures of you know oil rigs and money stacking up you know and rolls royces and all those types of um fun things so there's that and then the second element is um um about really Yogananda just comes in his actual voice and talks about describes the meditation posture and um, you know shoulder spine straight shoulder blades together etc and focusing on your Christ consciousness center and um, joy wisdom and spiritual perception as, as the as the forms of God that are manifest in the devotee and finally the latter part really links back into the uh, James Lynn thing again and uh, Phil Goldberg describing the really important role that um, James Lynn played in um, self-realization fellowship so what did you guys uh, without going into uh, too much detail what did you guys think of this minute Mike yeah I'm glad they put him in a prominent spot there and really put him in the kind of um, perspective that you have to see him like you said so Goldberg put him into a prominent spot in his book as well, because he, um, what once master knew him, um, he obviously developed very quickly as a yogi, but he also, his money enabled Guruji to do a lot of the things that he did later on. For example, that India trip that he, that he did later. And also like, we'll see more i mean i'm not spoiling anything if i mention <laughs> i think now. you're probably going to mention encinitas as well yes so yes yes, yes. yes. and Chris, um hang on. uh yeah he was also the second president of srf so that's why a lot of people see yes. his picture often. Yeah. so he's the first president that's not yogananda i imagine <laughs> that's yeah uh, chris what did you think of this minute he's yeah, it, again, um, to what Mike said, I think is uh, correct. It's uh, lovely to see this included in here. He's a very important part of the SRF journey. And to me, quite inspiring uh, in a sense that, you know, some of the words that will, you know, he's, he says here uh, in a minute, um, there's a lot of lessons that we learned, I think, from them. And, you know, he is somebody who experienced certain things and hasn't come through a, um, you know, a, uh, a very very poor background and gone into spirituality which is typically what people think of when you know they look at spirituality so he's come from the very western world into the eastern world to the nth degree so um you know if if he can certainly do that and uh, follow the path that he did 
uh, and, and have have a, a better life for it. There's inspiration for a lot of people in the West. So it's kind of kind of like a very, it's a very critical person, I think, in SRF story and the journey. So it's good good coverage. Really good point, Chris. And um, those are the questions I'm going to cover. Actually, how we can learn from that uh, that example, but. If you want to know more about um, Raja C. Janakananda or James Lynn, there's a fantastic book called A Western Yogi. And really it's about, it's, it's really a biography, but not written by any one person. It's just a collection of, you know, articles and letters and things like that. Um, and there's, there's lots of, um, you know, love, absolutely stunning pictures of, uh, of James Lynn and, um, you know, and, um, and Paramahansa Yogananda, you know, they're always together, hand in hand. Um, you know, Paramahansa Yogananda referred to, to him as Saint Lin, um, which kind of tells you how elevated he must have thought he was. Um, and he was actually born like only seven months before Paramahansa Yogananda, so he's a little bit older. And um, he often said that they had twin karma, you know, they were close friends and they were linked through their life. Um, that's yeah so mm. let's 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 read a little bit about um and those pictures that i mentioned that are in the book are also um in the film you know there's there's three or four lovely pictures of uh, of them looking at each other and things like that in the um in in the film so let's let's really talk about that guys if you want to open card two um let's talk about his uh what he was like as a young person so brahma you know in the brahmachari stage of life or the you know the student stage of life um Mike, do you want to read the, um, how he was an exemplar student? Yes. So the, the law school um, exacted J, uh, Jimmy Lin's promise to make up the high school education that he had missed. He carried his full law school course and high school subjects at the same time. Within a year, he added a, a correspondence course in accounting to the load. He soaked up education in three different fields by night and held a full-time job by day. Wow. Yeah. So he's, his career started very young and he, you know, excelled very, very well, you know, as a junior and such that obviously he, 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 he was, you know, in the insurance company, they wanted to give him big promotions, etc. But he was so young, they, they were scared to give them to him. But do, mm -hmm. look, look, look at that. So he st studying law, he was had to, because he was ahead, he had to, like, um, finish his other studies, and he did accountancy as well. So he was really, really good. And I remember back to thinking about back to my school, uh, university days, you know, I, I was always, I couldn't do what he did. I was like, you know, I'm studying engineering, even though there's like 50 topics in engineering, but I don't want to go and study like a humanities subject at the same time. You know, I, I just would have, wouldn't have, didn't think I was capable of doing that. Is that, but James Lynn here, clearly he was, he was, I don't, I don't know if he was a genius, you know, he may have been, but is there room guys? What do you guys think? Is there a limit to our education and study? Should we do what I did or should you be more open, Chris? You know the wonderful thing about life is the individuality of it, and the and the um, if the difference uh, in, in each of us. You know we're we're all unique, and uh, you know he's had specific karma over over many incarnations. And uh, to to kind of take it back a little bit, he was born into relative poverty. You know he didn't actually you he, he didn't have a you know a silver spoon in his mouth. So I I find you know studying reading about uh, very uh, high successful individuals. Uh, on on earth, you know, financially, they tend to come from quite tough backgrounds uh, a lot of the time. And what to me that shows is the polarization. You kind of want the things that you don't have, and some of it is very material in the sense of, you know, you see it, you want it. Um, I forget I forget the name for it uh, in in the yogic terms, but but that is a a, a phase that we must work through uh, in some ways when we see an object and we want the object. So I, I just look at it and think, well, he's clearly had a lot of motivation coming from the place that he mm. came from. You know, he was, you know, he had that success within him, baked it within him, maybe from previous incarnations, and he was born into poverty and he wanted something different. So you can move mountains when you when you have that, you know, select ingredients, uh, and uh, yeah, he clearly had it. So 
Yeah, yeah. yeah America, um, back to my well, the point about multifactorial education america is quite probably a world leader in that you know you major in one thing and you have different minors and you can change your change your course after two years and things like this isn't that right mike um i know you're you're wearing mike youtube listeners wearing your virginia virginia data science t-shirt he's just graduated a few months ago after his second or third degree mike so he's taking after his father's footsteps <laughs> uh, my, my first master's degree so fast um, it's a bit more flexible, um, I would say, because like you said, you have kind of minors and masters and you can at, at especially in your undergrad courses, you have a lot of other um, things in there than just your major. Like in Europe, I was used to when I start, studied computer science, there was computer science and nothing else. And I had some, some free subjects that I could choose, some optional ones. But here it's more like you half the subjects are of your major and the rest is like um, you, you have uh, subjects that, that are more from all the other fields. And in the master's degree, it's a bit more focused, but also allows you more flexibility. Um, I'm not sure. He, he, his example is a bit extreme, though. Like he, um, did, he did high school, apparently, at the same time as, as his um, accounting classes. And yeah. And a full-time job and a lot of full-time job. I mean, <laughs> you can you can do all those things. Like I I oftentimes when I read Guruji's books and or or when I read Gyana Mata, Daya Mata, like the amount of work that they did was completely insane. And at the same time, they were they were so spiritually advanced, which kind of tells you that you can you can do both as long they always say you have to do it for God. And then you can get a lot of this um, reward out of it. So it's not taking you out of your spiritual comfort zone, but it actually pushes you further in there. Mm. Saying yes. uh, bite off more than you can chew and chew, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's, there's an idea somewhere, maybe you guys can uh, flesh this out a little bit, where when you do become more spiritually advanced, um, you're able to run different tracks of thinking in your mind at once, um, essentially able to juggle a lot more activities uh, at once with, with high concentration. And I just wonder, you know, was he, as uh, you can under put it, you know, karmically aligned in some previous life, life of being a highly advanced yogi and mm -hmm. he was able to kind of use that there's benefit to do multiple things that's very very pertinent point we'll cover that uh, a bit later in this minute uh, when we talk about his relationship with the uh, guruji but yeah just going back to um uh his his willpower so the reason he had to do those three things or wanted to is because when he when he was obviously young he, he wanted to work because his family didn't have much but then he was so smart that they you know he was able to go you know get, go study law but that to, to study law you need to have finished your schooling but he was already past you know schooling age so they made him finish his high school whilst doing the law but then he wanted to do accounting so then he just did everything whilst working so it's just insanely um insane but that that led to a very obviously a very driven and determined individual no doubt with some extreme yogic capabilities which we'll cover a bit later but chris do you want to do you want to read about read out how um, you know when he established himself in his career after a very successful career how the multiple businesses that he owned you know read out that section mm -hmm. sure the year 1951 people who like the ring of the term this year 1951 people who like the ring of the term business empire could put mr lin in the empire class at least by kansas city standards it spreads into three separate insurance operations into oil production, citrus fruits, railroading, and a substantial banking interest. Financially, the or original Epperson enterprise is now overshadowed by oil, but it is the largest recipro reciprocal fire exchange in the world. Yeah, so, so that um, that exchange was the business that where he was studying and working at the same time. And he actually, when he was in his mid-20s, he 
he um, he put an offer an offer to buy the company, and the 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 bank manager was like, "Firstly, you're like you know in your twenties. How the hell do you expect me to give you a loan for however many millions this was?" And he's and and the and obviously then he established, then he realized what kind of individual he was, and then he apparently he personally underwrote the the check that for the loan and he said it was the best loan that uh, the bank has ever issued um yeah so you can see and and to add to this multiple businesses he obviously as mike said um supported heavily by 1951 he would have been a heavily heavy supporter of self-realization fellowship so that's um you know some other stuff that he would have done and um so is you know what about the people that say um is this you know in this world, who has time for meditation? And we see Rajasri Janakananda as an epic example for us. But Mike, what do you say to people like that? Like my sister just said that I don't have time to meditate. <laughs> I mean, the, the, there's um, a need for balance in life, right? We're in Dwapara Yuga and there's <laughs> um, work is part of, of our life. And, you know, like you, when you start out on the spiritual path, Maybe meditating eight hours a day is not right for you. Maybe there is other things you need to do. And there's this poem in, in metaphysical healing affirmations, right? Where it says, guide my hands in activity, lest in sloth I lose thee, I will find thee in activity, right? So I feel, I feel like sloth is like really what you don't want. You want to be active. You want to create, to be in a creative process. And I feel like they perpetuate each other, the, the spiritual and the, and, the, and the working part. That's, the, that's kind of one of the balances you need to strike in life. Chris, what do you say to such people as my sister? <laughs> <laughs> not. She may be listening, so. <laughs> uh, well, if, if, she, if she is listening, uh, you know, good, good, on, good on her. <laughs> thanks for thanks for listening first of all uh, but um i you know I, I think i think this is this is a pretty pretty good example of what mike gave um to be active is 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 key and you know righteous righteous actions are so, somewhat somewhat difficult to decipher because ultimately you know um oil and gas you could, you could quite easily argue hasn't really Done much good for the environment but actually in, in this case it's led to something quite spectacular you know in in setting up financial success for for uh, an organization that should bring should bring much more benefits so um you know it's kind of it's kind of hard to know the right right righteous action and you know what you should do and when you should do it but uh i i think i think uh you know what's what's meant for you won't pass you by so just keep keep doing what you're doing um, and uh, keep praying and, and uh, ask it, ask for for strength and forgiveness and all that stuff. So, um. Yeah. So why I, I what I did say to my sister when when she um, when she said that was I said, do you have time for um, mental ill health or like physical ill health? And she, and she said no. I said, well, you to, any any everything has a cost, and the cost of without even talking about spirituality, the cost of physical and mental health is that you need to work on yourself, isn't it? You have to, you have to meditate. And um, yeah, so she started now, but uh, still on the early phases of her, her journey. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a really good um, uh, part in the lessons <laughs> with, uh, you know, the SRF, where it talks about the magnetism and, you know, the, whether you have your know, business magnetism and, Lynn, uh, Lynn was originally described as a business of magnet or spiritual magnet magnetism. You know, you kind of have to put a lot of effort and focus and, and energy into either one. Um, so, you know, it's just a, a choice at the end of the day. Uh, what is it you wish to, to focus on, on garnering? So, you know, people get to pick their poison, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. On poison, let's talk about something a bit less, a bit more lighthearted. So, in in halfway through this minute, there's a picture of James Lynn in a cowboy hat and cowboy shoes, with like with his um, foot on this railing, um, like tap clapping his knee, and behind it um, is nothing other than some fields. 
But if you look at the book, so that's in the that's a shot in the film. But if you look in the book, uh, a Western yogi, that that same photo is there, presumably the original. And in the book, it says J J Lin, D Moss number one. So somehow or for some reason, they've photoshopped that little sign out of the movie shot. Now this is obviously extremely geeky, and we would only ever discover such a thing because we're doing this minute by minute analysis. And in minute eleven, when this um, when this came along, you know, when this what the shot was actually in minute eleven. Sorry, uh, we talked about this. We didn't know who it was, but we now know who it is. And um, why do you guy uh, Mike? Do you have any theories as to why they photoshopped that sign out? <laughs> mm. Maybe they would have thought it a distraction in the context, but I, I don't really, I don't really know what, why things like that happen. Because I, if I if I was probably releasing this book, I would have probably left it in, um, because it kind of shows the kind of environment and stuff that was there. But now I don't really know why they would. Chris, I know you had a this interesting theory on it. I suppose I'm questioning myself now. D Moss, uh, is that North North uh, N01? I thought maybe this was some sort of address or this was going to be something that identified a loca location um, or something that the people in maybe James Lynn's family that uh, maybe they wanted removed uh, in giving permission for it. They, they said, okay, well, maybe you can use this, but you can't use that. That was a theory of mine. I, I just, just shot the dark. I've no idea. We have no clue. So, really, really, listeners, if you watch minute eleven, there's a there's a little picture of Jim James Lynn, and it comes and goes. We talked about it before, but we don't know why that sign has been removed. So, if anyone knows, if anyone is geekier than us, which I doubt there is, then please do comment and let us know. <laughs> Let's talk about done now. It very well as well. Yeah, you really have, never yeah. notice. Yeah, uh, yeah, true. Good job. <laughs> Um, right, so let's talk about um, now the relationship between Paramahansa Yogananda and uh, Raja Sijanakananda. So Raja Sijanakananda became Raja Sijanakananda in, um, in 1951 when he took his sannyas vows and got initiated to them through Paramahansa Yogananda. Raja Si means divine power and it's the name of the Lord in respect of the cosmic mother. In another Sanskrit etymological meaning, Rajasi also signifies the king of the saints. Um, I think this is described in the autobiography of Yogi, like Raja Rishi. Rishi is a saint and Raja is obviously king. And Janakananda means the bliss of Janaka. And Janaka was a great king as well as a fully self-realized master of ancient India. So a very nice name that he was uh, entitled. Um, but let's talk about uh, Yogananda and um, and, um, and and Rajasi Janakananda. Uh, Chris, um, sorry, Mike, do you want to scroll down to on on minute on card four at the very bottom? I've got you to read something out there. Um, so you are a Hindu yogi. Yes. You are a Hindu yogi of Himalayan hermitages of the past, appearing in this life as an American prince, a Western Maharaja yogi that will light the lamp of self-realization in many groping hearts. In him and in a number of others in the West has fulfilled a prophecy uttered by our great master, Babaji of India, who said in 1894, the vibrations of many spiritually seeking souls in the West come flood-like to me. I perceive potential saints in America and Europe waiting to be awakened. Europe, yes. <laughs> so this is um, obviously, <laughs> this is a section in the autobiography of Yogi as well. Um, and so this is Paramahansa Yogananda writing this about, um, about Raja Sijanagananda. And he, you know, in the, in, in the Western, you know, a Western Yogi, he, he writes, um, who has, you know, of all the, all the women disciples I have, the, Sis, uh, you know, Gyana Mata has is the the foremost in you know God's favor as a lady disciple, and Rajasi Janakaranda is foremost in God's favor as a um, you know masculine example. 
of um, of that uh, divine relationship. So uh, very um, very profound there. Uh, very touching words that uh, Guru would write, and he would have actually been. You know, they both the the first autobiography was released, and Rajasi would have actually read this description of him. Um, and you know, as as we said, they were very close friends. Um, Chris, do you want to read the second part that uh, I've got there? Yeah. I know how religiously Mr. Lin conducts his life. He doesn't drink or smoke. He follows a simple diet of vegetables and fruit juices. He leads a celibate life. He doesn't go to the movies. For recreation, he sits on the grass and meditates on the divine. His whole existence is an exalted one. Even though he attends to heavy business duties, and is required to travel extensively in connection with his business responsibilities. He has had many temptations thrown in his way, but he has not succumbed to them. He has felt that joy within which is greater than anything the world can offer. Lord, thou art more tempting than any other temptation. Wow, so very elevated um, soul, as you can see, very simple. He used to like apparently he used to like spending a lot of time outdoors and a lot of pictures you'll see in the western yogi you'll see that he's almost very scantily dressed just very you know just a little loincloth over his um, lower region and he um so he obviously used to love getting the solar energy out of uh, out of the uh, sky and you know they get that get that contact um did you what do you guys make of all these lovely pictures in the film and in uh, in the book uh, mike well, you see, some of them you see Rajasi together with Master and this amazing friendship that they had. So they always smile together. Um, there must have been a really nice vibration. Um, and then in, in the book, you, you keep reading that they kept right, when they were in different places, they kept writing each other letters, which is like the equivalent of today, writing each other WhatsApp messages or something like that, right? Um, and then they, um, I heard like when it was the other one's birthday, they would give them little presents or little toys or something as a present. And I think that they had a, a very sweet relationship with each other. Well, one thing I, I want to quickly mention is that you, you hear about Rajasi's life and you got to think how his life must have changed once he met Master, right? Because he was like this business guy who probably didn't know much about spirituality because it wasn't um, brought to him yet, right? And then he meets Guruji and he goes all in on this super yeah. fast. Right? Chris, yeah, Chris, uh, why don't you read the next bit where, where it says, uh, well, this is Rajasi Janakananda, he says about his first meeting in 1932 of, um, of Guruji. Do you want to read that out, Chris? Yeah, uh, I had always been interested in truth and religion although I had never accepted any church. My life was business, but my soul was sick and my body was decaying and my mind was disturbed. I was so nervous I couldn't sit still. After I had met Param Paramahansaji and had been with him a little while, I became aware that I was sitting very still. I was motionless. I didn't seem to be breathing. I wondered about it and looked up at Paramahansaji, a deep white, a deep white light appeared, seeming to fill the entire room. I became a part of that wondrous light. Since that time, I have been free from nervousness. On the path of self-realization, one becomes alive again. He actually lives. He feels the divine life within him. Man is not God, but God is in man. The sooner we realize that his, he dwells in us, the sooner we become to the realization that we come to the realization of what our real life is. So that's a collection of um, sex, uh, things that Rajasi has written about uh, Yogananda and their first meeting and his past. So quite a transformation, as you imagine, a nervous you know, person that couldn't sit still to this illustrious saint, as Yogananda called him and mm. became obviously Raja Sijanaganda. What are your thoughts on that uh, that blossoming, uh, Chris? Well, again, it, it just kind of makes me think of the magnetism 
And, you know, if he was a business magnet, well, what, what does that really mean? You know, we use this word quite often that he already had some level or power of con concentration and he had that ability to transition to the spiritual magnetism uh, more than somebody who might have been a sloth or, you know, somebody who's, you know, no, no concentration, no willpower. He was somebody who's with really strong willpower. So he clearly was able to punch through that veil quite, quite readily um, and apply himself. Uh, it just makes me wonder how many more people are out there that, you know, given the right nudge could go on to achieve quite um, good success in the spiritual path as well. Um, but the, whenever, going back to the last question you asked, Mike, um, about the pictures and the images, whenever I saw them, I thought they used very well his the first picture of uh, Mr. Lin, where he's looking quite deeply or intently into the camera. And it reminded me of Yogananda, you know, that magnetism in his eyes, you know, it, it was very, very powerful. Um, clearly somebody uh, of deep spiritual advancement. So uh, he, he also had very good posture. You might say mm. he didn't sit, he was, he was very nervous or he didn't really sit still, um, but he clearly was somebody with good posture. He kept his spine straight. You can see that kind of in every single picture, you know, he's very, very much upright. Um, so, you know, he, he was a guy with really good discipline, uh, really high discipline. Um, and you, you can tell that in every aspect of the material that we have, all the information we have on. Yes. So, so as I mentioned that he, um, he was, you know, he, they didn't narrate using his voice. They just narrated uh, with a, a voice actor. But let's hear what his voice actually sounds like. So here's a little talk from Raja Sijanakananda. I have no desire. I hope I may never have a desire for anything for myself. If I did, it would probably have to be satisfied, and in consequence, I would suffer some delusion in order to have that satisfied. I have suffered a great deal of delusion in this life. I'm going to indulge for a minute in speaking, not of myself so much as to tell you of an experience. Please do not think that I talk about myself because I dislike the idea of thinking about myself. Uh, very nice, nicely spoken. Could, could, um, you can hear the devotion in his voice, right, Mac? What, what do you hear when you hear him? Very cool. I, I think this might have been the first time I've ever heard his voice. Cool. Find that, that audio clip. Um, I, I imagined him maybe a bit like this. He, he talked very, very humbly all the time. And maybe it's like because he, he was living this material life for the first half of his life that he now um, tries to put it all into a different perspective. Maybe also because he's a Westerner and can talk in a Westerner perspective and thinks that's what people in the West need to hear. Um, I really like the, the, the thought that I don't have any desires. And if I had a desire for myself, it would be attached with car mind. I would have to work it out. And so he's completely aware of all of this. That's, that's pretty amazing. And, and you, you got to imagine this is the guy who... <laughs> who built like a, a fire insurance exchange and an oil company and a railroad empire and stuff, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> amazing. Chris? Yeah, again, uh, what Mike said, 100%, he's, he, he mentioned the word illusion. And to me, that rings true of somebody who really can see through that that veil. You know, he, he knows that... Um, and I, it doesn't really sound to me like there's any kind of judgment in desi desires either. You know, he's just simply saying like, well, you know, you can we have your desires if you want to. They just come with a whole lot of baggage and illusion. And then you're going to have to, you know, get, you know, work through that. So he's, he's, he just sounds like a very practical person um, when, it, when it comes to, you know, how he manages his time. And I'm sure Guruji loved that, right? Because Guruji was all about, you know, manage your time wisely. Like, don't, don't waste your time. Don't, don't do, do sit idly, you know, be active, act now. So um, I can see why 
Gurdjie would have had a lot in common with this this soul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I feel like one thing that like when you see how he did in school versus how Guruji did in school, <laughs> <laughs> one one shouldn't forget that Guruji wasn't focused on school because he didn't see the value in school. He saw the value in being at the Hermitage of Sri Yukteswar and meditating all day because he wanted to sprint to the divine. And, and that also uh, takes a lot of um, discipline and strength to do, right? So he, he was, wanted to sprint his way to the infinite, and that's not easy either. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just wonder, is there like a spiritual background of, of conspiracy behind the two uh, souls, you know, coming together to, you know, two souls incarnate roughly at the same time. One takes a very material, you know, <laughs> uh, path in life, tees up the other one, and they both <laughs> knock it, knock it uh, out yeah, of the they, they, they write about For this sure. in, in um, Rajasi's book. Um, it basically says that that when a master incarnates, he uh, has his chelas also incarnate with him in different places so they can stri- strategically place so they can help him later on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and they it's quite quite a deep relationship. And um, so, for example, whenever Mr. Lin would arrive in LA from Kansas City, where he had his business operations, Master would apparently garland him with flowers, and you know, in the in the Indian fashion. Can you imagine a guru garlanding a devotee? That's uh, that's quite profound, mm-hmm. isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a pretty rare relationship such as that they have and you're going to have the said of their relationship some some say some people say the western man cannot meditate that is not true master declared since mr lin first received kriya yoga i have never seen him when he was not inwardly communing with god mm-hmm. so some uh, fruit for food for thought for us perhaps high, high concentration <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, a role model. Role model, role model indeed. I'd um, highly recommend uh, you guys read the uh, book of Western Yogi. It's uh, filled with uh, gems, as it were. Um, let's uh, let's now go to um, Paramahansa Yogananda. Filled with, filled with riches. With riches. <laughs> riches of uh, all kinds. It's a theme. It's a theme for today. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go now to the um, second part of this minute, which is about the prayer that uh, Paramahansa Yogananda um, recites, really. Um, and it's his own voice. So again, we're privileged again to have the rare minute where we actually not only see Yogananda, but we actually hear his voice. And he kind of says, reveal thyself as joy with wisdom, spiritual perception. And again and again, say, reveal thyself. And as he um, as he says this, like the, 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 the camera is kind of zooms in on uh, Rajasi's med- meditating face. So obviously a nice, uh, very nice shot there. Um, do you guys use the technique of reveal thyself, reveal thyself? That plea, yeah. Mike, you, Mike, you're nodding away. You're saying it right now. <laughs> yeah, I use it a lot. I think I, I got it taught as a kid. Um, uh, because when I didn't have any techniques, that was like one of the first things I did. Um, but also, I think at some point somebody asked Guruji, is there another way to sprint to God without Kriya Yoga? And he said, yeah, you keep your consciousness the whole time on the spiritual eye. And I feel like that's kind of what it is. You look at the spiritual eye and say, reveal thyself. Come, come up, come out behind this darkness yeah and that's, i think that's a very powerful very easy technique chris I, I remember hearing it for the first time when i was in london and it was a very emotional uh, response actually that it, it garnered out of me because there is something behind it that there's this deep deep desire i think in all of our srf community to know god and you know reveal thyself is is tantalizing because it is just behind the veil of our, our God is just just there. You know, He's with us, and you know we we we, uh, we, we use those words, and they have such meaning behind them. Uh, it's such sim- simple words. So I, I love it. Yeah, it's it's one that whenever I kind of go back to 
sign and meditation, uh, I immediately get get into a place that's uh, beneficial. Yeah. Nice. If anybody doesn't and, use it, I would recommend. <laughs> and Mike, Mike alluded to um, the practice of focusing your attention at the Christ Consciousness Center. And this is really a um, very, it does not really link to the technique of just saying, reveal thyself. Um, this is a practice in its own right, um, just keeping your attention here. And Yogananda obviously often tells us, uh, he tells us to as often as possible to keep your concentration here. So something like it's the um, seat of God or something something along those lines. Mike, do you practice that technique? Not just when saying reveal thyself, but otherwise, even say not, not obviously not during your meditation practices, because that's when we're told to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try to, obviously. Um, it's always like, it's like a refuge sometimes. You know, you feel like you're a bit too nervous, maybe. And then you feel like you need to go within. This is the key to go within always, right? You put your attention there and it's, it helps you go back inside. Sometimes it sucks you back in. <laughs> Chris? You know, sometimes when, when I, more times than not, when I forget to, um, sometimes I get, you know, the, the little kind of reminder and it kind of comes through, <laughs> through, uh, through that channel um, to pay attention to something, you know, that something is significant and it's like, oh yeah, right. Okay. So, I, you know, I should be <laughs> right. Concentration here. You know, that's, um, I, I sometimes get these, these reminders that, um, uh, yeah, are, are, are uh, going back to, Yogananda's teachings are uh, significant because it's so easy just to lapse out of concentration. Um, but uh, yeah, e effectively, yes. And it's not all by my own making. I, I, I uh, surmise. Yeah, I've, I've tend to now revert to it quite heavily when I'm uh, trying to use willpower. So I tend to just focusing. Yeah. yeah, go on, Chris. Do you know, I know, I know um, Frank, you like chess and um, <laughs> I, I, I'm enjoying it as well. Mike, I, I, know, I know you're, you're, a, you're, you're a fan, you're a fan as well. But what I've been enjoying... Sorry, why, why are you laughing, Mike? Is some sort of inside chess? I, no, because I, I'm just imagining Chris now playing chess and like... <laughs> yeah, no, this is where <laughs> I'm going. He's, 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 not looking, he's not looking at the board. He's this is, this is where I'm going with this. Actually, like you're, you're you're completely completely on the right lines. But what? No, I notice I notice a lot of the chess players they do like this or something, and they mm -hmm. sit and they you know because you, you're watching this in COVID times. Uh, well, okay, so for for podcast listeners, uh, Chris Sorry, has yeah. just like got his fingers to his like, temp uh, to his forehead. It's, it's kind of like the they almost do like a yeah. little almost like a little triangle or something, you know, subconsciously, and a lot of them do it. A bit Already. like a bit like Chris, that looks like one of our practices called Jyoti Mudra, which you won't know about, but it looks very similar okay. to one of the mudras that you do in Kriya. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I figured the top top people in chess, you know, their concentration levels are pretty 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 good, but they all do this eventually when they're trying to channel more concentration. <laughs> so I think they're just doing it subconsciously. <laughs> can, you, can you also move the the pieces without? <laughs> <laughs> astral astral chess yeah. <laughs> it, it might it might improve some of your elo points that we like try, try that next time <laughs> um yeah so back to my uh, what i was saying about we yeah, are willpower i tend to use it with willpower anything if i'm at um if i don't uh, so I, I went to a couple of uh, or quite a few different temples recently in india and if I didn't have a prayer to offer, I'd just place my attention there and, you know, really focus your attention there and really kind of, you can, you can also knit your, kind of knit your eyes and eyebrows towards that direction to really focus your, your energy there. And I found it very powerful. So I'd, I'd, I would recommend it. Maybe a question just on, 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 on air, so to speak. Um, you can add the dots talk about, you know, looking towards the eyebrow the channel, channel the concentration. I'm presuming not always is necessary if you can put your awareness there as opposed to your, you know, joining your physical eyes towards that point. Because it's to do with the Mandula Blangata for, for, for listeners and channeling a parallel energy source, isn't it? But um, 
what what's what's your take on that uh guys is, is it necessary always you know you can't walk walk around as was looking <laughs> looking up to your <laughs> to your penal gland but I, I feel like it changes your consciousness like you know when you think thoughts you think sometimes they are random they just come to me but when you th sometimes it's an indication where your consciousness is and when your consciousness is up here the thoughts that come to you they tend to be more refined more useful more constructive and i feel like for that reason it's useful to be up there as much as one can also yep um uh, the awareness is actually a very interesting point, Chris. <laughs> Chris is uh, Chris is doing the mudra now. <laughs> He's created his own it's mudra. Chess, we'll call it the chess mudra. Chess, chess mudra. Let's, let's, can I, let's take it. That's all. This is how I'll beat you in chess next time, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're gonna have to get somebody else to, to make the moves for you the, the awareness <laughs> thing the back to the serious topic of that uh, christ consciousness or the kutashta center which is uh, as chris alluded to is the polar opposite of the um medulla center the agna chakra and the you raised an interesting point about not having to focus your energy there but feeling you know putting your awareness there because sometimes you, uh, if you're, you know, in, in some sort of zone, you may feel, um, you may feel a tingling sensation in that area. And, uh, and should that happen, then obviously you'd, you'd wish to just, you don't need to knit your eyebrows and focus, you can just focus on that. Um, you can just, just be with that sensation and see where that sensation leads. And often it will just be to a place of, you know, absolute stillness. And as I look at that, there's a, like on my desktop, there's a picture of a lake and I'm imagining a very still lake, you know, the lake of your mind or Manas Um But yeah, yeah. so it's, um, it's a, quite a powerful, powerful tool to use any, any, any part of those things that um, Yogananda has talked about in this prayer. So really he's, he's actually told us some techniques there. So if you listen out in, in this film, there's techniques all over the place, like reveal yourself is one, uh, focusing your attention at Christ consciousness center is, is quite a technique in itself. Um, you know, someone mentioned, someone asked on our Facebook channel, uh, where can I, I don't have, I don't have money. Like where can I get Korea? And I was like, oh, wow, well, I, I don't know how to answer this, but uh, there's, there's, there's practices all over in, in yoga and there's teachings in there. Just, you just have to know, um, know where to look um, and know what you're reading when you read it, because any of these practices, I'm sure, in themselves are enough to take you to divinity. Mm. Well, even if you did have money, you know, the story of Elvis, whether you know, I, I, I don't know the um, verification if it was verified, but going in to kind of say to Sri Dharma, you know, I'll give you a good chunk of money for the the lessons. You know, it can buy you the lessons, uh, so it'll it'll come when it comes, uh, and you know, the forces will uh, conspire together to to ensure that that it, that it happens. I suppose. I, I think that person should still go to an ashram and talk to them i'm sure there will be a way <laughs> i'll uh, feed that back so the, the third element of this um, prayer is that yogananda says um reveal thyself and then the second part is as joy wisdom and spiritual perception so those are those are three really um quite um what, what should i say profound experiences should they come to you if you see if you experience divinity as joy first of all um which which many of us can do experience in meditation as wisdom and not just uh, regular wisdom but divine wisdom we're talking about here and spiritual perception each three obviously quite different and unique um do you how do you guys feel about seeing divinity as these three elements mike um I feel like joy is the thing that is oftentimes attributed to it more than wisdom. Um, I feel like wisdom is something that is sometimes attributed maybe falsely to the intellect um, because it gives you this ability to think things through. And then once you thought it through, you know how to 
handle it, but then it's not always so easy, right? And wisdom through um, divine perception is is a different thing. It is basically Guruji telling you what he thinks you should do, and that's the right way to do it. Um, I think they're all equally um, important. And spiritual perception, I think in this context probably means like experiencing God, right? So that's that's like um, all all those three things I would like to have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure you. We each have them, but in such subtle ways that um, they're not easily identifiable as manifest. For example, um, if you compare yourself to how you were one year ago or five years ago or ten years ago, in each of those categories, and I'm sure this applies to each of us, you'll be pleasantly proud of yourself and surprised and happy. <laughs> mm. Chris, what do, what do you feel about these three triune um, ex- manifestations of divinity? Well, I, I, th- I think to, to your points there, they come in fleeting glimpses initially and with time and persistence, they would stay more constant in, in one's life, at least in theory, that's how I understand it. Um, until until I get to that point, I uh, I went to the material sense and got a canal boat and called it joy, so that I was in joy all the time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, Very nice. Yeah, but, you know, um, I, I I think I think these are, as Yogananda puts it, the the natural state of human beings, um, and we we have to work diligently to try to get back to those states um, over many lifetimes. We fall out fall out of the way of that and, um <clears throat> yeah i i there, there's such simplicity to it isn't there when, when i first heard it i thought oh is it really you know joy is that how to surmise maybe love or ecstasy you know is, is joy really sufficient you know i kept i kept like that that was my first initial thinking when or feeling when it came to me but the more joy the word joy um uh resonates with me it comes with peace and lasting, everlasting, this joy is there's something very eternal of, about it. So uh, it, it's definitely, you know, grown on me in a sense. The, the more I meditate, um, the more I see that to be true. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there, there's definite, um, I, you know, what, what actual, actually struck me whenever you were speaking earlier was uh, I wonder, again, to how much activity there is in the world. Uh, that is is wasted activity uh without joy without divine wisdom uh and, and so on you know what actions would we be taking uh we're all chasing something you know um uh, mr lin said himself he had such material wealth but still very unsatisfied and it wasn't until he went to the spiritual uh, activity did he you know did he um uh see things differently so i just wonder how much I, activity out there in the world would actually just be like siphoned out if you actually were in joy and you know we're, we're with wisdom 24 7 the world would be a very different place so yeah i fantasize about it sometimes mm-hmm. what about um as divine wisdom and as spiritual awakening so yeah knowledge the, was, there, there's good sayings that I can't really pull to the top of my mind right now about wisdom, but um, uh, you know, wisdom might be uh, you know knowing what which which uh, end of the knife to hold kind of thing, um, uh, and uh, yeah, so you don't end up hurting yourself with <laughs> with, <laughs> with it. Um, and uh, it's it's something you know I I've, speaking from personally uh, personal experience, I've my father is uh, somebody who's been a good role model for me when it comes to wisdom very fortunate uh, to have that and it tends to be for me um acting out of a place of calmness and peace uh and then going forth in the war into the world uh, and acting acting accordingly because there's um a lot of restlessness and that with uh, w- without wisdom without this peace and calmness uh yeah causes causes a lot of uh you know, illicit activity. So, so yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a very, very um, simplistic, but with some, uh, the simplicity uh, encapsulates uh, a true understanding 
isn't it? The more you kind of delve into, you know, observing these words, the more you see it is all encapsulating true uh, to the nature of, of God and, and love. Very good. Beautiful, Chris. So let's move on to the closing element of this uh, minute. I want to go back to um, Raja Sijanakananda. So we talked about um, the transformation of himself, you know, through his business life and then into his spiritual, you know, spiritually realized life. Um, but let, and we talked about how Yogananda, you know, and him had this unique relationship. Now, Rajasi also lived a few years on from Guruji. So he, he was actually, you know, around when Master took his Mahasamadhi. So guys, if you open up the closing reading card. Um, so in 1954, um, a couple of years after Guruji had his uh, Mahasamadhi, they were, um, they were having, they were celebrating um, Master's birthday in 1954, January, uh, January the 5th. And Mike, do you want to read out what he said to the people around at that time? I woke around two or three o'clock in the morning on January 5th and saw Lahiri Mahashaya in the greatest place of light in which he has ever manifested to me. Then, one by one, Sri Yukteswar, Babaji, and Master appeared. Master lifted me out of the body and we floated together over many gatherings of people. Master blessed each group as we floated over it. We were not talking, but floating overhead. We were not walking, sorry. We were not walking. Ah, we were not walking. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. We were not walking, but floating overhead. It seemed as though Master wanted all the people to know that I was with him. Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so this is uh, quite profound. So before we read how when Yogananda first met uh, um, uh, Raja Sijanakananda or James Lynn, he had this experience of light, you know, filling the room, etc. And this amazing stillness that he had. And obviously that in itself is quite profound. So no doubt through their lives, they would have had shared lots of spiritually munificent uh, moments. And this is probably... <laughs> quite uh, quite up there, isn't it? Out of all of the experiences I've heard from direct disciples of Yogananda, this deserves a place in the autobiography of a yogi, does it not, Chris? <laughs> it, I, I was curious as to the references in the autobiography of a yogi um, being kind of lacking uh, on, on, on Mr. Lin for, for all the significance that I had. Um, I suppose reading this, uh, it, it's spectacular isn't it and like you said Grant probably deserves his place somewhere um you know uh, of mention but for him to be meeting Babaji in these states he clearly you know Yogananda talks about it meeting Babaji getting a bit or was it sorry maybe I'm getting mixed up with here in Mahasha maybe but somebody getting very excited and Babaji saying okay I'm gone you know <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, you know your your mental activity is kind of like a whirlwind and kind of blowing it blowing him away so he was obviously very very advanced and um yeah it's, it's beautiful just reading this reading this story and mike i think you were quite blown away by your own reading now you've had time to absorb it <laughs> how are you how did it feel for you i mean what an experience i mean come on <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's obviously january 5th uh guruji's birthday right so yeah. he um it's like Guruji's birthday party and he gets to join in and he brought a special guest. He brought Rajasi and they are having like their whole birthday ceremony in the astral plane, apparently some, something like this. I love how he says like, um, I saw Lahiri Mahashaya in the greatest place in which he ever manifested to me. Like, <laughs> of course, he manifested to me many times. Yeah, before. that's, that's yeah. I picked up on that. So that's multiple, <laughs> multiple occurrences. <laughs> and you know, our, our monks rarely talk about their spiritual mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, I think he, the presidents are given a special dispensation to talk about their 
um, spiritual experiences. And, and you know, Daya Mata also talks about, you know, when she went to Babaji's cave and how he manifested himself to her and revealed, you know, various things about humanity and things like that, and which is obviously beautifully expressed. So these are rare, rare gems that we get. So because they're the, pretty much the presidents are the only ones which openly um, talk about them. But no doubt the other monastics may have had this and other experiences that we know not of. But if you do, guys, listeners, if you know of any equally beautiful stories such as this, please do um, share and we will also mention them in the coming podcasts. Um, that pretty much sums up the minute. Um, does anyone have any other business before we uh, read some last passages? Chris? No, not really. Um, I, I, th I think, you know, this is a character, you know, a, a, or a character, the, the, the meaning why it's <laughs> uh, you know, this, this great, great uh, soul, but um, somebody who really was held dearly in the heart of uh, Yogananda. And, uh, you know, whenever I look at, look at this individual, <clears throat> as I said at the beginning, there's so many so much great wisdom that comes from him uh, and you know he was somebody who lived righteously and really sought god out and eventually came to it and there was something said in the minute where it, uh, he said oh um initially i was skeptical we all were something like this um and that just shows that even with the initial skepticism following the processes and steps that Yogananda laid out, he was able to, fight, to, to get to this great satisfaction of, of knowing, knowing, uh, knowing God, having union. Uh, and it's just a great story, isn't it? Um, so much inspiration in this Western world, and Yogananda calls him the Western yoga uh, or, or so on. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a brilliant, um, brilliant uh, role model for us. <laughs> Chris, uh, sorry, Mike. Um, I'm glad the, the movie basically, because we're doing minute 30 today, and minute 30 starts exactly with talking about Rajasi, and it, it kind of lasts exactly a minute. So it gives us exactly a full minute <laughs> to talk about Rajasi, which fits perfectly. Um, one thing I, I feel like we have to talk about a little bit is uh, Chris's spectacular background that he has there. <laughs> And where he just yeah. he opened the window to this jungle paradise behind him. Yeah, it's, it's getting hot. A little weather update for you guys. I know it's been a while since he's done <laughs> <laughs> in Brazil still. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a yoga retreat in, in Brazil. Uh, my fiance's uh, dad has been building it for, for some years. So um, just been, been uh, riding off their internet, uh, hij hijacking that for the, for the last hour or two. <laughs> No, it's a different mm -hmm. backdrop. If you see the monkeys, they, they love to jump through those bamboo trees uh, behind me. There's a little <laughs> family of them come and steal the banana straight nice. out of your hand. Nice. Yeah. Share some pictures of those. We'll put them on our social media. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So before we end, let's just have a quick, um, quick sum, not summary, but a quick bit about um, his last. Uh, his last moments of his uh, of Rajasi Janakananda's life. Um, and I've found a section here, which I'll read out if I may. Um, his last day finally came and he, he was, he had, you know, he had a, he had a, he was suffering from illnesses. He had tumor and things like that over the last couple of years. And apparently Yogananda said that, um, <laughs> well, he said he was ready to leave and Yogananda kind of encouraged him to, to stay on. Um, this was obviously a few years before he actually passed away. So it was in uh, February 20th, 1955. 1955. Daya Mata, Mbrinini Mata, Saila Suta and Durga Mata were with him. Durga Ma held his hand in hers to the end. Rajasi, the illumined yogi, merged into the light. Even outwardly, a white light began to surround his head. Mm. The light kept getting brighter and brighter around it. Then his breath vanished. Yogananda's little prince was in eternity. As Yogananda had told him, the infinite kingdom is yours. Take a room. Take a room. Take a room.